Think to yourself, what do you use your PC for? Is it for gaming? Is it for browsing the web? Is it for watching videos? Is it for editing videos? Chances are, if you're just using it for browsing the web and gaming, you probably overspent on your motherboard. So today we're gonna to talk about something that's kind of taboo and that is spending less money on your motherboard. Now, I myself love a good product smackdown. Like, I will hop on the bandwagon wherever it is justifiable. But channels like Gamers Nexus and uh, Buildzoid kind of end up pushing people away from products that would be otherwise perfect for them. So today, let's take a quick look at the A520 motherboard and why it's probably all the motherboard you really need. So here we have the ASRock A520M HDV motherboard. Now, it is Ryzen, third gen Ryzen and up. So if you had like a first gen Ryzen or a second gen Ryzen, you would need an A320 motherboard for that. And uh, that will operate up until third gen Ryzen. So Ryzen 1000 through 3000, you need an A320 motherboard and then Ryzen 3000 to 5000, and then maybe whatever they have on AM4 beyond that. But I seriously doubt they're going to be putting anything else on AM4 after uh, this year. So let's do a quick little unboxing. It comes with two SATA cables. I stole one from this uh, box because it's been sitting on a shelf for a while. An IO shield, a screw for your M.2 drive. So if you have an M.2 SATA or NVMe, it works with either of them. <laughs> Surprisingly enough, it has a CD for um, your drivers, which is really bizarre in the uh, current year. And then a manual for uh, installation, plug-in, what connector does what, what part does what, how to put on, you know, super easy stuff. And then below that, there's a piece of cardboard and a motherboard. Comes in a bag, an anti-static bag that's not even taped shut, so. Really not a lot going on here. All right, so what do you get for the 50 to $60 that this thing costs? You get a four pin power connector, your standard 24 pin, you have dual channel RAM, CPU socket, six phase VRM, not much going on there. Very basic HD audio, a clear CMOS uh, terminal here, uh, TPMS one, com, two USB 2.0s, a fan connector, a speaker connector, all of your front panel IO, four SATA connectors, a USB 3.0, another fan header, another fan header, a PCI 1X slot, a PCI 16X slot, an NVMe M.2 slot here, so you can put a SATA or an M.2 in here, but keep in mind if you do put a SATA drive in here, you will lose one of the, uh, the SATA drives over here. So like, yeah. I know I'm not 100% sure on this board. Let's just take a quick look in the manual. All right, so it doesn't say it in the manual, but usually when you install something in the M.2 drive, you lose one of your SATA ports on the side. So you definitely wanna look into that if you're trying to use all of the IO on this. For the rear IO, we have a PS2 port. We have two USB 2.0s. We have a HDMI, a DVI, a VGA, four USB 3.0s, ethernet and some basic audio jacks. Now, if you opted to spend a few extra dollars on this uh, motherboard and got the AC edition, you would have some kind of uh, Wi-Fi up at the top here. So yeah, pretty basic, but for most systems, this is all you need. You got front panel USB and audio jacks. You got a USB 3.0 coming out the front. Most people only use dual channel RAM. If you need more fans, fan splitters are always an option. So honestly, how much more motherboard do you really need? So you're probably thinking to yourself, okay, Gabe, all that's real great and whatnot. You're just showing me a cheap motherboard, showing me how much it has on it, but how does it perform? So you're probably also wondering why I have a 6900 XT sitting here. Well, today we're gonna run it with a 6900 XT and a 5800X in rage mode to show that gaming performance is largely unaffected by the motherboard that you're using. We also have 16 gigabytes of the dankest RAM possible. This is Triton Z Neo. It is 3,800 megahertz CL14. So it is some of the craziest fast RAM that you can buy. This RAM also costs uh, four times as much as this motherboard. And here we have the Ryzen 7 5800X. This is a eight core 16 thread processor capable of boosting to around uh, 4.8 gigahertz. Now keep in mind, this does have PCI 4.0, but the motherboard does not. So how will that affect 
the performance of our 6900 XT. Let's get this all loaded up on Benchy here. Now, in the past, I've done some pretty ridiculous things with motherboards, trying to kill their VRMs, like using an A320 motherboard with a 16 core Ryzen 9 3950X, and then using that same Ryzen 9 3950X with a super cheap B450 motherboard. But every single time I've done those videos, I've tried to make it as a worst case scenario for the motherboard. And I feel like that's created kind of a, a bad image on the motherboard because I'm doing something that nobody expects it to be good at. Like running Prime 95 on an A320 motherboard is not realistic. No one's gonna do that. Like no one's gonna push a workload like that through an A320 motherboard. It's just not realistic. But I love trying to do it to see what the limits of the hardware is. So I'm really trying to show the A320 or A520 in a better light today because I've just been a really terrible person to it. <laughs> so we're gonna go ahead and use a Wraith Prism cooler for this video. Now, what I wanna focus on mainly with this is it's a blowdown style cooler. Like it's pushing air straight down onto the motherboard. And what that's doing is it's pushing fresh air from above the CPU down into the motherboard and just moving air over those VRMs. So those VRMs are completely exposed. They need to have airflow. Now, any airflow is probably good enough, but in the past, I've always done these videos where I have no airflow over the VRMs and they just, just the temperatures just soar to the moon. So I feel kind of bad about that. This is the kind of cooler that you should definitely be using if you're using a motherboard like this with exposed VRMs. Having it blow straight down at the motherboard is the best case scenario. I'm also gonna be using a second fan here just to blow air over the motherboard because again, before I would have no airflow over the motherboard and it would just be starving and getting so hot. But that was kind of the point of those videos. So we're doing something completely different today where we show the A520 in a better light. Go ahead and put on our GPU. So one thing that's pretty funny about this GPU on this motherboard is there is literally no clearance for plugging in any of your front panel connectors, like none. Like you might be able to squeeze some USB and audio stuff in here, but for the most part, if you're putting this in a case, it would be crushing all this. So obviously you can't use this with a really gigantic GPU, but uh, if you had a different layout here where say the PCI 16X slot was further away, it would definitely be doable. Again, we're just doing this to show it's not that bad. All right, let's get this thing fired up and show you guys what kind of settings we can run in the BIOS. All right, so we're in the BIOS. We have a Ryzen 7 5800X. We have 16 gigabytes of RAM showing up. Now, I'm a little upset because this A-series motherboard doesn't have PBO settings like my last A-series motherboard. So I'm a little upset about that. <laughs> like my A320 motherboard from Asus does have PBO settings that you can adjust. And who needs overclocking settings when you have PBO settings? So just something that this one doesn't have. So let's go ahead and load up an XMP. And then also because this is Ryzen 5000, it's so much better about running at uh, 1900 megahertz uh, fabric clock than older Ryzen processors. So we'll just run it at uh, 1900 megahertz. And then let's go ahead and set up the adjustable bar. So we have to turn off compatibility support module just to disable that and then go back to advanced and then in PCI configuration we just enable and then enable the resizable bar and that's it that's all we're going to change in the BIOS for this okay so once we're in Windows we want to go ahead and turn on rage mode so to do that we just go up to the performance tab in the AMD Radeon software and then to tuning and then preset and rage mode so before, when I would do these kinds of tests, I would usually have no airflow over the VRMs like I've stated before. And if I ran Cinebench R20, it would usually always thermal throttle the VRMs before it would even complete a Cinebench pass. So now that we have airflow over our VRMs, how does it affect that? So let's go ahead and make a quick Cinebench pass. Oh wow, it's drawing 140 watts, which is about 40 watts more than this uh, processor is specifically rated at really hear that uh, CPU cooler going too. So it's sitting at about 140 watts and 4.4 uh, gigahertz all core, so not bad. We're getting up to about 80 degrees Celsius. It might start throttling based off of CPU temperature, 
but it doesn't appear to be throttling based off of anything else. I'm really impressed with its ability to uh, maintain those clock speeds with uh, how warm it is. Like ADC is uh, pretty toasty for a desktop processor. So it finished a Cinebench pass and it looks pretty much par for the course for a 5800X. So before we ran it, it managed a 5800. This time it managed a 5660. So relatively in the, uh, the realm of uh, realistic for this processor. Again, it didn't throttle at all during that pass. So if you're not gonna have any kind of heatsink on your VRM, make sure you have some kind of airflow over those VRMs. So let's just go ahead and load up a game like uh, Counter-Strike. This game is notoriously CPU intensive, but I think we'll find that uh, it doesn't even seem phased by those VRMs. Just use the workshop map. We use Mr. Uletical's uh, benchmark. This has some older CSGO textures, so it lets the FPS go way higher than it would if you were just in like, say, a bot game. Man, you can really hear the coil whine on this GPU. Speaking of coil whine, get subscribed. We just check all the boxes and start up the map. And then we don't have to touch anything. So straight out the bat, it's uh, it's getting well over 800 FPS. Obviously that comes down some throughout the, uh, the, the benchmark, but uh, it is really impressive how much FPS uh, Ryzen 5000 can pull. Like we're seeing over 800 FPS in this benchmark. Obviously going through the, uh, the, the gas cloud kind of brings it down some. And then some uh, character models brings it down a little bit. So it looks like we got a 703 FPS average out of that. So uh, not bad, not, not bad at all. Considering our first gen Ryzen 1700 overclocked on a $400 motherboard scored uh, half that, uh, not bad. What about a game that can use multiple CPU cores like Cyberpunk? That hiss you're hearing is the graphics card. This thing is super loud. Some people get really offended by coil wine. I, I really don't. I feel like it is a, um, it's kind of like having a loud exhaust in your car. It, if it's powerful, it's gonna be louder. Let's just go ahead and set the video settings to absolute minimum here. We want it to be as CPU bound as possible. I use this manual save in a very crowded area because it, uh, it tends to pull more uh, CPU power. Okay, so we're getting about 120 FPS. sitting at about 50% CPU utilization with uh, about 110 uh, watts being pulled off of it. It seems completely unfazed to me though. Again, this game is far more GPU bound than CPU bound, but it does use a lot of processing power to, uh, to keep up. I mean, we're almost at 180 FPS in some of these less crowded areas and the CPU is doing it without a sweat. I think I even saw over 200 there for a second. Yeah, I mean, looking at stuff on the walls can push it up over 200. So let's just go ahead and run a quick 3D mark just to get a good idea of where this system performs compared to other like systems. So for the most part in uh, 3D mark, it is GPU bound, but there is one test that is specifically CPU intensive. So we'll see what it does. Or you can see CPU wattage is all the way up to 130 watts. So Pretty crazy there. But let's see where this system scores compared to other like systems that probably have much more expensive motherboards. So we scored just behind the average. I don't see anything specifically wrong with these charts. Now, these little dips here might be points of throttling, but they're not too crazy. Uh, also, it might just be a part of this benchmark to have less CPU load in these specific spots. So not too bad. So if all you're using your PC for is gaming, browsing the web, maybe some light photo or video editing, you should be fine. Now, if you're somebody who is constantly encoding or rendering videos or rendering, you know, Blender, like, you know, doing simulations, maybe this isn't the kind of motherboard for you where you need to have a constant sustained 100% CPU workload, this isn't for you. But if all you're doing is just gaming and, and browsing the web, you're fine. So if you're gonna take away anything from this video, it's that you should sleep better at night knowing your motherboard is probably fine. I still get tons of comments on one of my previous videos 
ask, people asking, you know, if can I use this motherboard with this processor? Should I use this motherboard with this processor? And you know, I'm always like, yeah, it's fine because I was doing something awful to that poor motherboard in that video that you shouldn't do, which is run it on an open test bench with no airflow. I just thought it was funny to try to blow up the, <laughs> the BRMs, but obviously they throttle just fine. So I don't specifically say that you should use this motherboard in any build, like it, but obviously it works just fine. The funniest thing to me about this specific combination of parts is some people might go out and spend like 200 plus dollars on a B550 or X570 motherboard only to pair it with a 5600X and then you just lose out on so much performance where you could have bought a cheap motherboard for $50 and paired it with a 5800X and got two more cores. Now, granted, should you do that? A lot of people are going to yell at me in the comments for saying that this is even a remotely possible setup, but honestly, I can't find anything wrong with it. If you have a good airflow case with a decent blowdown style cooler, there's nothing specifically wrong with this. So I don't know. I'm not gonna say that you should definitely use this for your next build, but I'm saying you definitely should consider if you're building something that is lower end. If you're building something with a six core Ryzen processor, you're probably fine. I wanna say probably, you're definitely fine with using a motherboard like this. So whatever motherboard you pick that is above this, you're definitely fine. So yeah, go ahead and yell at me in the comments about how this is a terrible idea and nobody should do this. Like the video, dislike the video because I'm probably wrong. Get subscribed for me being wrong in the future and I'll see you next time.